Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the EBB Stakeholder Meeting Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to our host, Ms. Debbie Thompson, Deputy Director of Adult Programs of the California Department of Social Services. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today in our ongoing discussion about the new federal requirement for electronic visit verification. Um, I'm just going to give uh, spend a little bit of time giving um, some information out, and then I want to spend the majority of time taking comment and listening to, to input around this, this next piece that we're working on or looking at for EVV, and um, so we should have quite, quite a bit of time for that. Uh, but I am going to start with just a brief, brief, for those of you who have, may not have joined us prior, um, synopsis of electronic visit verification is a new federal mandate that was signed into law December of 2016, and it's a requirement for personal care service providers by January 2019 to use an electronic visit verification system. Um, that uh, is the requirement, it, and states are required to implement that. If they do not implement, then there is a escalating federal penalty um, to the federal funding of the program. It starts at a quarter of a, per a percentage point and escalates to one percentage point of the federal funding for the program. Um, so in the first few years, that would take it up to, for just the IHSS program, about $180 million a year. And that's not a one-time, that's an ongoing uh, annual amount um, until it's implemented. So the state is working on planning, intending to implement that, the requirement, but we are planning to do that in a way that is most inclusive of our stakeholders' um, feedback and making it be the least cumbersome possible and to really listening and working with all of our recipients, our providers, and all other stakeholders to do this in a way that is um, workable for the program. And that's really what the focus of today is going to be about. We've had a couple of um, previous stakeholder meetings um, in addition to also the budget hearings, where we got to hear a lot of feedback from recipients and providers, as well as other stakeholders, about um, EVV and what people are thinking about it and what the main concerns are about it. Um, we did a request for information and heard from different vendors about what they have as far as tools for EVV, and we've done some webinars that were um, conducted by CMS and listened to those to hear what, if any, further direction they had regarding implementation of this new requirement. And what we've done is spent time taking all of that information in and coming up with a kind of a proposed um, concept or pr approach that we want to sh start sharing with folks today and then start hearing back from you if you think that we are on track with the things that we're thinking about, if, you're, if we're hearing the things that you're concerned about and if we're addressing those as a part of doing, um, doing this. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about and walking through once I've walk through that concept, that proposed idea of how we can approach this in the state of California, I um, then want to spend the rest of the time hearing input and your thoughts about what I've, what I've said and other con any other concerns that you have about electronic visit verification. So that's what we're going to be doing um, today. So one of the 
I'm kind of kind of approach this from the things that we've heard and kind of what we're what we're thinking in relationship to that. Firstly, as we already shared, um, the requirement to complete this or implement this by January 2019 is not something that's realistic in the state of California, and we won't be implementing as of January 2019. We will be working with CMS to. Um, um, demonstrate a good faith effort in our implementation approach to uh, extend any, uh, delay any potential penalties, um, requesting that through CMS, and we will um, uh, be working with stakeholders and recipients and providers to really come up with our development and implementation approach and a timeline that works for that approach. Um, so that I wanted to start with that. The next thing is feedback that we heard as far as how we do this. While we did put out the request for information and heard back from a variety of vendors, a lot of that what we heard is doing this within our own system that we already have within the programs made the most uh, sense to everyone. And that is what we believe also and would be our intended approach to utilize systems that, that we already have that we're, we're doing in IHSS already. So last year, as many people are, were aware, we implemented the electronic timesheets. We have um, that system in place that has seemed to be a positive approach for um, for many of our providers already. We're looking at building on that tool, that system, as an approach to EVV and expanding it to not only be an online system, but also include the option to do a telephonic option, meaning using the telephone versus something <coughs> online, as well as an app. One of the things that we were hearing um, from all of our um, feedback was that it was important there be a variety of ways that providers and recipients could utilize an electronic visit um, verification system. So we're looking at something that could be utilized online, through an app, or through the telephone. So that's um, the next uh, piece of what we were hearing. A big piece of what we were also hearing was the concern around GPS and the utilization of GPS in this kind of a tool. That is not a requirement under the electronic visit verification statute, and it is not something that we intend to do for um, California. So we won't be use, utilizing GPS for purposes of identifying location. One of the requirements is to identify location. We're looking at doing that simply as the provider identity the location of service and keeping it very simple, such as home or community or both. So keeping it very broad, very simple, and reported as time is reported, just location would be reported, not tracked through GPS. So we would not be utilizing GPS. Another thing that we heard clearly was around so many of our um, providers live with the recipients that they care for. They provide services periodically throughout the day. It's not a set start and end time. And so we really wanted to take that into account and consideration when we were thinking about you know, ways to approach this. And so again, we're not looking at, and we had already um, shared that our reading of the statute does not require um, the reporting of a start and end time to be done in real time, meaning you have to check in at 9 o'clock somewhere and check out when you leave at 1, whatever it is. But that it just needs to be captured, that needs to be reported, a start and end time. So we're looking at a, a situation where the provider when they're entering 
all of the other information that they would need to enter, such as the number of hours that they worked and the location, they would also enter their start time for that day and their end time for that day. And they would enter their start time being the time they provide the first service of the day and the end time being the time that they provide the last service of the day. So perhaps I started providing services at 9 in the morning and my last one I provided at 9 at night, that's my start and my end time, but my total number of hours that I enter for the day may be three. Because within that 12-hour time, I was doing different services that totaled three hours. But that's the first time and the last time are the start and the end time. So we're trying to account for not having a situation where someone living with the recipient has to check in at 7 in the morning and then out at 8 and then back in at 11 and out at noon, depending on how they're providing services throughout the day. We wanted to eliminate that um, difficulty and make it much more simple. Um, we also, in hearing some information back from CMS, understand that the requirement around the type of service being reported and the fact that IHSS actually has 25 individual services, it does not have to be reported in EVV at that level of detail. It can simply be that it is a, a personal care type service, which IHSS is all considered personal care type services. So the provider would not have to be providing any further detail to that um, level of service than it's already just an IHSS service. So that was um, a good good feedback that we had, a positive um, feedback that we had from CMS in that area. So I kind of hit on the areas that we've heard concerns about and the ways that we're thinking of approaching it. Before I, I open it up for comment, I want to walk through an actual concept of how this would kind of work. And I want to also talk about the recipient's role um, and what what it would mean for them. So from the provider, at, at, at whatever point in time it was most convenient for them, whether it be the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the pay period, or something in between, they would be going into whichever format they chose, whether it be online, into the portal, whether it be through the app or through the telephone, they would be going into that system and entering that information. As they do today, they would enter the number of hours they worked on the day. And then there would be a couple of additional elements they would also enter. They would enter the start time for that day and the end time for that day in the way that we just talked about, meaning the time they first provided a service and the last time they provided a service. And I should say, for that recipient. So if I did work for multiple recipients, just like now I fill out multiple timesheets, <laughs> then I would enter it this way separately for multiple recipients. But if it's for one recipient that I'm working for, it's the time I started providing service for them that day and the time I ended, and then indicating location, either in the home, in the community, or both because you may have done part of the service in the home during the day and may have done part of the service in the community that day. So it could be both. So they would be entering that information. Once that information was entered, then as they do today, the recipient would be responsible for reviewing and approving that time. So the, for the recipient, it would be once a pay period, like it is today, that they would be reviewing the information and approving it. The difference for recipients who are using paper today would be instead they would be doing that approval either online or by telephone. So you would be either going online into the website and entering, um, reviewing the information and putting in your PIN number with the approval or 
you would be doing that through telephone, where the telephone call would come to you and you would be read the information and then give approval through a PIN number. Again, that would be once a pay period, just like approving a timesheet today. So we're trying to keep it as least cumbersome as we can. The difference would be online or by telephone versus paper, and there would be the additional pieces of information available for you. You would have the start time and the end time and the location of service. So you'd be able to see the information or hear the information if it was by telephone, and then um, approve or reject that information if it was um, correct or incorrect. We also are, and we have not gotten very far because we're doing this in steps, um, we are looking at how we would also be able to provide history and documentation of all of the service hours because we did also hear clearly from recipients um, that it was important for their records that they be able to have that documentation of hours that providers had worked for them, as well as for the providers to have record of their worked hours. So that's also an area that we um, will be sure to account for through this process. This system would also, as our electronic timesheet system does today, provide some prompts and um, support to providers as they fill out timesheets. So for instance, in our electronic timesheet system today, if someone's entering their time, if they have reached the number of hours they can work for the week under the FLSA, under the new FLSA rules, it will actually tell them, you know, you've reached, if you enter this many hours, you potentially could get a violation. Now remember, violate, there's no new violations related to electronic visit verification. This is prompts to help with the overtime caps and rules that would be in the system, like it's in electronic timesheets today. So that's kind of the concept. Before I move to comment, I also wanted to talk about, because I want to make sure that people understand, even um, once we kind of agree to or get feedback on and know the concept, we intend to have a full and um, thorough involvement of stakeholders and recipients and providers in the whole process. So similar to what we did when we did electronic timesheets, the approach would be, once we know what we want to do, is that when we did electronic timesheets, what we did is we had our, our system folks develop a prototype that then we had some providers and recipients come in and look at and play with and give us feedback as a part of the development process to tell us what worked, what didn't work, how um, we might need to change it, and we, we developed it in collaboration with bringing in recipients and providers. Then we did a pilot where we tested it further, and then we rolled it out slowly um, so that we made sure there was enough support for people as they were learning new processes. So we're looking at that same model that we use with electronic timesheets as kind of a model of how to approach doing this with electronic visit verification system. So those are kind of our thoughts so far, kind of what we're, we're thinking based on everything we've heard thus far. We wanted to um, get back together quickly with this group to hear, are we on the right track with the things you're concerned about? Is there other things that we sh we've missed or we need to be thinking about or addressing? And that's what I'd like to spend the rest of today opening this up to really hearing people's um, thoughts and concerns and feedback so that um, we're, we're sure we're taking into account everything people are concerned about or worried about in this process. Okay. So why don't we open and do I have, I think 
somebody's going to come around and bring you a microphone if you have a question. And we'll start the first few in the room, and then we'll open it up to the phone line as well, and we'll kind of rotate back and forth between the, the two. There you go. So, Sue, I think maybe. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bernita Munoz, and I take care of Tobin. Uh, my question is, because I get the supervisional hours, so I have the mask. Uh, how does it work when you, when you take care of the person 24 7 but only getting paid 9 or 10 hours a day? So when we were, that's part of what we were talking about with a start and an end time, and perhaps for for you it's the 24-hour period. I start at six in the morning, I end at six in the six the next morning. But the number of hours that you are reporting would be just like you do your timesheet today. But the thing is, if you're working 24 hours, you, you, your start time and end time never stop. It's going. And I understand that, but the program doesn't pay 24 hours a day. Right. So some, somehow you need to report the time you need to be paid for. So you would need to put that on your, your time sheet. Right? And we can certainly talk more about protective supervision and exactly how you would indicate that. Um, so, in uh, the a lot of what you guys are talking about, and in some of the prior things, um, most of these comments in uh, the way that the program is designed is for IHSS services. Um, I believe the Cures Act and the EBB requirement also affect uh, regional center and DBS based services. Do you guys plan on putting out a separate RFI uh, to get information from uh, providers within under those categories? So when we did the RFI, we actually asked them to respond to both models. And so folks that operate those programs actually were able to see information in relationship to that from the vendors. But they will be doing separate um, stakeholder processes to discuss how the, um, that model will work. Mario Moto, California Disability and Community Action Network, CD Camp. First of all, thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks for the outline of, of, of the concept. Uh, two questions. Um, regarding the review of the information, um, you mentioned that either by telephone, well, if it would be a telephone or online uh, for the recipient, and making sure if the information was correct. So the first question is, if what if you're not able to reach that person for various reasons? Does that impact the uh, ability for the person to be, for the provider to be paid? And, and what, what happens if you're not able to reach that person because they're, you know, for various reasons, the phone's not working, they're out of town or whatever? Uh, and then second type of that is if the information is wrong or the recipient says no, uh, the information is not wrong there, What's the time frame to correct? I mean, again, does that impact the provider in terms of getting paid, or how does that impact anybody in terms of the information is not correct, and how do you correct it? So again, thanks for doing this. Sure. And so just let me say that actually we have already built into the electronic timesheet um, system. This is how it's working already. Um, so on the electronic timesheet system, the at the time the provider enters their information at the end of the pay period, an email goes to their recipient who then knows to go into the system and approve it. And they all the recipients currently in the electronic timesheet system have the ability to do this by telephone as well. And I believe they can do an inbound call if they so choose, or the system will also call them. Um, and there seems to be what we've experienced is good coordination between the recipients and the providers to ensure this. But the system also does 
track is there. And I'm going to let Sue speak to this because she's nodding her head and she's much more <laughs> technically savvy on how it works currently than I am. So let's go ahead and add. From a content perspective, if the recipient has to receive the NTT approved by telephone, um, the system will automatically call the recipient. If they do not answer the first time, it will call back um, a certain amount of time and um, so that we can ensure that if the recipient's not available the first time, they don't keep trying until the recipient is in contact with. And we haven't had, as far as I know, a, a problem with a, a, any kind of major delay. And the system does evaluate for that. So we would know if something is stuck. <laughs> That's right. And if the recipient does reject the time sheet, either he's signed or through electronic time sheet, the provider is notified. So that the provider can go and collect the time sheet and then submit it. Oh, one other thing that's tied to that, thanks, uh, is will this mean, as part of the implementation, will there be more of a mandatory requirement to, for people to migrate to electronic time sheets? Well, um, there'll be a mandatory. There's, EVV is a mandatory requirement, and we're looking at. ET, building on and enhancing our ETS system as a way to meet that EVV requirement. So. As EVV is rolled out, um, then recipients and providers would need to select um, an option for doing EVV. If there are, for, for folks who are already on electronic timesheets, it will probably be simpler because basically they would be doing the same thing they're doing today with adding some of the, the additional information, the start and end time and the um, location in the same system, in the same system scenario. But we're also expanding so it wouldn't just be the application the portal, the online option, but also expanding our telephonic that it's available to providers, not just recipients to approve, but providers to enter, and then also an app. And as E V V rolled out, then providers and recipients would choose one of those. Hi, my name is Cindy. I am um, from Berkeley. I'm on the board of um, board directors for EBI in Berkeley. And I am curious how I'm curious how well, I'm curious how this definitely would affect me because it's like I'm an independent person with a physical disability, permanent disability, and um, it would hamper um, the Flexibility that I already have with the family members that I utilize. I don't live with my family members because I independently, thank God. And, um, but I'm flexible with them, and there are times I'm flexible with me, and it gets done. I got to college, grad school, I volunteer, I work hard, <laughs> and, and so I'm just trying to get my mind around how I can be in a be, um, um, I guess correct. Um, in, in accordance with this law, this mandate, and so help you realize the safety net that helps me live and have a productive life. And that is the end. And that's absolutely what we want as well. Can you can you tell me because what we're trying to do is keep it as simple as possible. And if there's other things we can do, we absolutely want to know that. So. Currently, at the end of each pay period, you would sign timesheets for each of your mm -hmm. folks, correct? We both sign timesheets for Okay. And so for you as the recipient, you would be doing a similar thing, only instead of doing it on a paper timesheet, you would be doing it either online or via phone. So it would be the same information and the same Times. So, tell me what. Tell. I want to understand so that we maybe can address it. Let me go back and I'm not working full time or anything right now, but I'm doing other things full time, um, tutoring and things like that. So, just to get through college or graduate school, like I would have teachers and have the female teachers, and have the female teachers, and so I would have. I would, I knew like a circle of people I could call wherever I was in the Bay Area mm -hmm. if I was like not completely settled after I had um, an episode. And um, 
So to answer your question of how would I let me make sure I'm answering your question though. Okay. So you're saying how would I So my question is so right now as we do IHSS today, your providers have to complete a timesheet and then you have to review it and I didn't sign it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. And that's that's fine, but they're still responsible for reporting their time. Right. And a timesheet still gets filled out whether it's you or, or them. Right. So what we're trying to look at is keeping it as consistent as possible with the way things work <laughs> today. The disability is not consistent. My, my disability, I have um, dystonia, significant dystonia, and so there's no way I can understand my body's going to, I'm going to be stressed out, so I'm not going to be able to sit up straight, or I'm not going to be able to, you know, um, help my children or help me. So do you, do you understand that this doesn't require you to set a schedule up front? You're, you're not you're not setting a schedule up front. No, no, no. I'm trying, and I'm not either. I'm just trying to understand what you're what what's causing the concern because I can't try and fix it if I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it fluctuates in different in different days, my disabilities. Absolutely. It happens. Excuse me. Among if I'm on my period or if I have a seizure or something like that, it fluctuates. So being able to record. Specific times and remember okay. those times and how long it took to get help with changing my clothes or something like that. Um, I'm wondering how this is all going to work. So cer certainly what your needs are each day are absolutely going to change from day to day as they do today. And this is not intended to change that at all. You don't have to upfront say they're going to work so many hours a day or what the schedule is going to be. It's a back in arrears like reporting, just like it is today, when they fill out their timesheet, they still go in and put how many hours they did each day for you, right? Sure. Hi, my name is Russell Rawling. I'm the Director of Advocacy Services and Resources for Independent Living. Independent Living Center starting in Sacramento, Yellow County. And we're hearing a lot of kind of general concerns. Um, I think that the previous conversation we were attempting to have is it's saying that um, you know that it's not setting a schedule in advance. It's reporting, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is how can you report when you're are are you going to be providing people with some sort of mechanism to track? You know, I mean that's a lot. It's a lot of labor to actually track what is happening <laughs> any given day and when services start to stop. Additionally, uh, what is going to be done with the information regarding where service is provided? Why is that information being collected and what purpose does it serve? So why don't I answer the second part of your question first, which is that location is a requirement of the statute. We um, attempted to keep it as broad as possible. We don't necessarily intend to do anything with it other than we're responsible for tracking tracking it. So home and community was what we felt was the kind of broadest that we, <laughs> we could keep it at. As far as um, tracking the information, um, I, I think that it may be easiest for providers although we don't, wouldn't be requiring them to enter information on a daily basis, it may be easiest for them to go on the telephone or online and just enter at the end of the day what their times were and the number of hours. Um, I believe a lot of people already use calendars just to track times and hours. Um, we're, we're trying to do it as simple as we can. I know there's some additional information, mainly the start time and the end time, um, for each day that's being collected in addition to what is collected today. Um, that we, ha we have to meet the mandate, and so that is one of the elements of the mandate. One small follow-up question as to meeting the, the mandate, right? 
is that um, you know the location has you've created broad, thankfully broad categories. Um, has CDSS was part of the RFI at all to question why this information was being gathered? Well, the RFI wouldn't have been able to re respond to that because this was a federal law, so they wouldn't have been the ones to have that information. Um, CMS, I think, is the intent from my all, the best I can understand is they want to ensure services are being delivered as they're being claimed. Part of that was location. I I'm Jordan Lindsay with the Arc of California. Um, just for a comment and a follow up question. I was just uh, hearing now from the way that you're trying to implement it in compliance, you know, the least intrusive as possible. Just want to give a compliment. It seems like really on the right track, and especially beginning and start, and not every beginning and start throughout the day, as well as location, um, you know, very broad categories. Um, I hope that would continue down that road of compliance, obviously, as least intrusive way as possible. Um, follow up question regarding the regional center providers. I just wasn't clear on that process. So, you have the prototype process that's going to come out in the testing lab. Will the DB providers be included in that prototype process or is DB as in their own rollout process? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, so, the, we've kind of split the two processes apart. So, the um, individual provider model is what I was what I'm talking about today. The other will go through another process, including development and how they approach it. But they did get information back on the RFI that they can utilize as a part of their process. Will you be be rolling out that for the other providers? Is yes gonna be in the process for rolling out and testing and Jim is back there too. So it's <laughs> not obvious. And it won't be DSS, it will be the other agencies that oversee those programs. Thank you very much. And we're going to take one more here in the room and then I want to go to the phones. Um, are you pretty sure that the federal government will accept these new categories? So we believe that we're in compliance based on their statute. They ask for location, they ask for a start and end time, they ask for a type of service, which they've indicated is the high level service. Um, they ask for, um, and I'd have to read the, the recipient, who the recipient is, who the provider is, um, the number of hours worked for the day. So yes, we believe that we are in in line with that statutory requirement. Okay, um, Rhonda, could we open the phone lines and ask um, folks for questions? Hello. I hope I didn't lose them all. Hello? Operator? Okay. I'm sorry, we had a little bit of difficulty there. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star than one on your touch tone phone. You'll hear a tone indicating you've been placed in queue. You may remove yourself from queue at any time by pressing the pound key. Once again, if you have a question, please press star than one at this time. Are they all? Question First question comes from the line of Thomas Gregory, Center for Independent Living. Please go ahead. 
Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, I wanted. To, I had a question about the uh, statutorily required element uh, of documenting the type of service performed. Um, I, I know from the uh, the March 9th uh, stakeholders meeting that California was committed to trying to make this documentation as painless and as non-specific as possible. Back in March, I remember there was talk about maybe the uh, the, the specificity could be. Uh, um, limited to which of the 25 or so categories of IHSS um, the services would fall into. If I, under, um, if I understood right today at the beginning, I think it was Debbie talking at the beginning of, uh, I think I heard that we wouldn't, uh, that providers wouldn't even have to get so specific as indicating which of the 25 or so categories of IHSS they had performed services within, but they'd simply enter did IHSS work or choose a drop down um, a category, which sounds fantastic to me. I'm really delighted if I'm understanding that right. So I just wanted to confirm that the extent of documenting the type of service performed would be indicating that the service was an IHSS service, and that's it. And I also want to confirm, would, would one documentation per shift suffice? In other words, between the time you clocked in for the day and the time you clocked out, the provider would simply have to indicate, I, I assume with a drop-down menu, that the type of service performed was an IHS service, and that would satisfy that. Am I correct there? Yes. Fantastic. That's even better than I would. That's, <laughs> that's and that's our understanding thus far from CMS as well. That that's the level of um, need that they have. So unless we hear something new from them, that's our understanding as well. Okay. Good news. Christina Mills from CF. ILD, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for holding another stakeholders meeting. This is Christina Mills from the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Um, RIL addressed most of our concerns, but I want to just further with the IHSS program has become more and more limited in a variety of ways over the past several years. So this process with EVV feels like it's being used to collect information that could be used to further limit the program in the future. I want to make sure that the time in and time out part that you've talked about extensively is not something or is a part of the statute requirement. And I'm also wondering if it is, is it something that you can ask CMS to further define what the purpose of it is? So yes, start and end times is a requirement in the statute as one of the elements to collect. Um, Again, we're trying to approach that from as least, least intrusive approach uh, as possible, um, going with the first service of the day start and the last service of the day end for uh, each recipient that's being served by that provider. Um, why they're requesting it, again, it's all part of this new um, approach that they have, clearly for the, the federal government, this was a part of program integrity. In California, we're seeking to um, meet the requirements with the least intrusive, least cumbersome approach for our recipients and still remain in compliance. Are you able to ask CMS for further explanation on that piece of it? I'm going to let DHCS respond. I think that um, certainly we could. I just think it is um, part of an, uh, several data fields that they're looking at just for verification purposes. It's not our understanding that they're using it for anything else but just to verify the start time and the end time. It's basically verifying the, when the service, the service verification. If the service was provided, mm -hmm. when it was provided, where it was provided. I think they, they haven't really, that's pretty much what we got from them. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh.
Dean Loomis from IHSS Consumer, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, and I would like to thank um, everyone for joining in and providing this uh, place where we can speak about the EVV. And I'd just like to make a, a quick comment on the technical. For those of us on the phone, it is difficult to hear the speakers in the room. We can hear, or at least for me, um, I can hear the main uh, uh, speaker, the presenter, very clearly, but not so much the questioners in the room. So it might be helpful for uh, them to briefly repeat the question as, as they heard it for us to follow along better. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine, I think we lost you. Christy oh, okay. Burchett from Educate Advocate, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for having this meeting. Really appreciate it. What I wanted to suggest is that um, you gave some information today that's all new information, that an email goes out to people that have been attending these calls, that it goes on your website, some samples of what you are talking about so people can actually see it you know, what's being proposed here as far as what a electronic timesheet, for instance, would look like with this program so we can see it because there's a lot of fear, apprehension about how this will be initiated in California and people just really need to see it. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you. I, I very much appreciate that suggestion. Um, we're not quite to the point where we actually have examples, but what we have done is we've put together a couple of documents that outlines the concept, We've a document that outlines the concept that we are discussing today, and that will be posted on our website as well as the recording of the um, meeting itself on the website. And as we begin development, um, we certainly will um, see what we can do as far as putting samples out there as much as possible. And for anyone who's interested in what electronic timesheets looks like. If you're a recipient or provider, you certainly could go on and set, an, set up an account for yourself and see what those look like um, as they are today. It would look very similar in the future. It would just have some additional um, information that you would be putting in. So that's one way to see kind of what, it, what the concept is um, because we'll be building on that is our proposed idea here based on whatever feedback um, we get today. Um, and thank you for that. I, I had intended at the end, but probably should have started earlier in saying the things that I did, that we have a website out there that has, um, that we're trying to post information on regularly. Um, we will post the information from today's meeting by tomorrow. And we can also send that out to all of our email distribution list so that people can see it and have it in writing as well as our conversation today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Carol Moss with IHSS Coalition, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for having this call. My question is, if someone is working for, say, two people in a given day, can they do their time, this, this verification with one phone call, or do they have to make two calls for each client? So we, we still are in the, the, the telephonic piece of this is newer. We're expanding that more. Right now, the telephonic is just for the recipient to approve. So we're, I, I don't have the detail of what that would look like yet. I will say on the online version, once they're signed into their site, they could complete more than one, a timesheet for more than one recipient at the same time. They don't need to go in and out to do that. Um, how it will work on the telephonic is, is not designed yet. So um, that's certainly something that um, we want to make it as easy as possible. So I think that I would take as feedback what you're saying, the ability to put in information on one phone call for more than one recipient would be something that would be wanted 
um, in designing that. Is that correct? Thank you. We have some um, comments in the room, so I'm going to go back to the room for a minute. I was just in Survivor in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I have one clarifying question and comment. Um, it, it, it's wonderful when we can start many times not being the times that <laughs> are supposed to be the real times. That was one of my hugest concerns. Thank you for that very much. Am I correct that that isn't going to be just limited to people who are living in the same house? Everyone's going to have that option? That's correct. Okay. So her question was um, the start and end time and that the way we're approaching it being that it's the first time you provide a service um, is the start time and the last time you provide a service is the end time um, uh, for, each re for each recipient you're providing service for. And she asked, does that apply to everyone and not just live-in providers? And the answer to that question was yes. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and is it in response to the people who are asking, you know, have the Centers for Medicaid Services provide clarification about why, you know, all this stuff? Because that's a lot of what people are feeling, I know, is why. I, I just want to remind folks that they're not the people who pass the law. They're just supposed to come up with the ways for it. If you've been following the whole Facebook thing, there's an actual committee that's been all over the news. It's the Energy and Commerce Committee. There's several people from California on it, including Anna Eshu from the Bay Area. Those are the people you need to be asking that question of. They are the ones who wrote this legislation. They are the ones who included it in a much bigger bill. They are the ones who can answer that and who could do something about changing any part of that. So I just want to encourage people, you know, if that's what you want to know, Start asking pointed questions of those people. Show up at their offices, you know, talk to their staff. Get behind this in that way. Um, final thing that I'd like to bring up. Um, I'm, I'm also a, a person with chemical sensitivities. I help run a, a nonprofit that represents people with chemical sensitivities and electrical sensitivities. So I know that there are people who will not be able to do the online option and the app option and might be limited to the phone. Um, but I also know that there are places where the phone companies are getting rid of landlines. And so that people might be in a position who could not do a cell phone or an online option, and then if they all of a sudden don't have a landline, what on earth would happen to them? Would there be a way that it's a matter of reasonable accommodation they could still use paper or, and I, 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 I don't know what, but, but it's really thing. And that is an outstanding question for us. We haven't, we know that, that there are some of those concerns out there and that's something that we'll have to be thinking through. Can I ask one more question quickly? Um, I'm just curious, um, if this is going to be a looming question mark in terms of um, the information that the are doing, um, is it, do you see that there will be, will be an escalation of um, the program information collection? Oh. Wait, keep, the, keep that because I probably need to ask you to clarify. So an escalation of collection of information. Correct. If you want to know if the community or the home, do you see there being an escalation exactly where, where in the community? No. We did that purposefully. We just made it home and community versus specific locations. And, and again, same thing. The, an the answer is no. We're purposely making choices to keep everything as simple and broad as possible. And you don't see an escalation in the future. Unless, unless we get federal, federal regulations that require it to be more specific, and we are not hearing that at this point. In fact, they have said that um, they're looking at a broad service type personal care. It doesn't have to be the individual services. And as far as location, we have, this is what we've chosen to meet that requirement. So that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Is there additional questions on the floor, um, on the phone, Rhonda? Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Can I call from Claudia Carenzo, please go ahead. Oh yes, yeah. thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. First, let me tell you that all of the people that you that ask questions at your location, I could not understand anything that was being said or hear them. Okay, that being said, if I repeat something, let me know. I am a provider and I work for a gentleman who does not have any electronic devices in his home, nor the ability to work them. I was the biggest advocate for electronic timesheets and we cannot do them because he does not have a reliable phone service or internet. And if he did, he wouldn't answer the questions reliably because he is medically classified as non-self-directing. So all of my stuff still has to be on paper. If he is, he, there, there's no Wi-Fi and he can't afford it. So he doesn't, we tried to get him a free cell phone, he couldn't work it. So my question, and I think you said he doesn't have even a landline telephone? Maybe he has a landline phone, but when I'm not there, he doesn't answer it. Okay. So the, the, land, the landline, the, the landline, the landline telephone is going to be an option with what we're looking at. Um, he doesn't have to answer it because he could initiate the call even while you're there to assist him. Okay, so then I would be able to go be with, when I'm there, we would do the verification call together. Which is what that I would do easy. with your timesheet now, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we do with the timesheet. I do the timesheet for him. He approves the hours and he signs it. Yeah. But I have so to use the figure. So you would do the do thing. You would be doing a similar thing with the telephone. Okay, so also you also mentioned where we could get more information, but you also mentioned that we could get this information only if we were enrolled and, and the website with the ETS. I am not involved in the ETS, unfortunately, because of that situation. I, I, I've been pushing it for five years to have electronic timesheets. So basically, can you give that website? And the other thing is that I'm understanding, it seems very clear to me, what they're going to do is want to start time and a t stop sign, a uh, stop time. For instance, you you're, get there at nine, do the first thing, you leave at three, do the second thing, uh, and in that during that time period where those uh, home and community, if it was okay from twelve to two, you did shopping or you brought them to the doctors, you'd simply put community, and if you started at nine with his personal care, you would put nine a.m. Left at three p.m. Two hours during the day, community that day or home all day. Is that it? Home and community? That doesn't sound difficult. So you're, you're, you're absolutely getting it. So <laughs> you wouldn't even have to identify the times for home or community. You would simply be identifying your start time and your end time and then like a checkbox of home, community, or both of them, if you did both of them. It's usually, it's usually both. Some days it's just home, but when he goes to the doctors or we do the shopping or blah, 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 then it's, it's both. So that's exactly. easy. The exactly. problem is the verification, and if we can, if, would it be possible for us to do that with the, are they doing that with the electronic timesheets now, that we can initiate the call on the deadline? So what I'm going to say to you is that if you're wanting to use electronic timesheets, already in our electronic timesheets option, you, mm -hmm. can, you would need to fill it out online, but the recipient can approve it by telephone and they can call in to do the approval. So you actually okay. could do electronic timesheets now with what you're describing. Okay, okay well, I'll, I'll think about that and I'll mention it with him and then on, on the rare occasion, well, and, and also, right now, you can do these within, you have up to two weeks after the pay period ends to file. Is that going to continue? For instance, you don't have to do this daily. At the end of the 14 days, of course, you keep track of every day, and you can fill it in at the end of your two-week period, or and yes. you still have how so, much time to the 15th or the 30th. So in the future with electronic visit verification, while you mm -hmm. have to capture the additional information each day, the start and end time, mm -hmm. and then the home or community, you do not mm -hmm. have to, 
you do not have to fill it out each day. You could you can you could fill it out each day. You could fill it out every other day. You could fill it out once a week, or you could fill it out at the end of the pay period, whichever is easiest for the um, provider and the recipient. So right now, the end of the pay periods are approximately the 15th and the end of the month. Correct. And right now, with paper, if your pay period ends on the 15th, and for some reason you didn't send you you have you have up to two weeks to send in your completed timesheet. Will that, what time frame will be in effect electronically? In other words, on the 15th, you don't have to send your thing in on the 15th. You can send it in the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, when you have time to get it together. And you're, you're asking me a new question that I didn't have, haven't really thought through for electronic visit verification yet. Um, <laughs> I. So I'm not going to answer it right now because I'm not sure. Um, but, but, what, but what I will say, but what I will say is the the sooner that you enter it at the end of the pay period, the more quickly payment is issued. And, and while I'm and while I'm saying that, what I'm saying is, is there going to be a grace period to electronically fill in your timesheet? Because sometimes, for instance, the 15th will fall on a Sunday or a holiday no, or something I, like I that. Got your, I got your question. I'm just not mm -hmm. sure of the answer, so I don't want to tell you something incorrect. And so I'm, I'm going to delay the answer to that. Okay. Maybe they give you two weeks. In other words, even if you sent in your timesheet a week after, right. it's okay. Because right. so right. you know, with the electronic, will it be four days? Will it be seven days? Like I said, because I work six days a week, so I'm not there on Sunday. I, um, I totally understand your question. I just don't want to give you misinformation, so that's something that I need to check on. But what I will say is the sooner that timesheets are submitted, the more quickly the provider receives payment. And, and I also want to add, because this was a question that I just recalled that we had, we had heard and I want to make sure that people know, is there was a question of now having to do, when people have to do electronic visit verification, will they sti still also have to do something else as far as timesheets? No. Once we're doing electronic visit verification and the person enters the information into that system, that information will be utilized to be able to issue the timesheet, so there won't be duplicate. What will happen is I will have to come home on my computer. I will have to figure out the, the schedule worked for the two weeks. I will then have to go to his house with a copy of it on a piece of paper, and then we will have to call it in together so that he can verify the hours. And, and that's, that's perfectly fine if that's what works for you, that's perfectly fine. We don't really have any other choice. It would work much better if we could just call in the hours together. If they want to come up with a telephone system, and then and basically with, on the 15th and, and the 30th. With electronic visit verification, there will be a telephone option to enter the information also. So you wouldn't have to go home and do it online and then come back and do it by telephone with him for verification. You could do it all by the telephone. He has a landline phone, so we can't enter in text. So will we be just answering But as a part of this, we are going to develop the option to call in on the telephone and enter all of the information on the telephone. So that's going to be something new. That's not something available with electronic timesheets. That's going to be something new. Okay. Well, my question, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry for being sick, but my question is, how do you enter information from a landline phone? There's no well, text. It's, it's, going to, it's going to either be using the keypad or speaking information. And there are mm -hmm. systems already in the world that people use for other things where you call in and there's an automated system that asks you questions and you either enter on the keypad or you speak information. It will be something mm -hmm. similar to that. So for instance, when we're developing this, okay, we call in and the telephone system will say, enter your number of hours for this pay period 
Or will they say, enter your number of hours for Monday? Where were you Monday? Enter your number of hours for Tuesday. Where were you Tuesday? Enter your number of hours for Wednesday. I mean, it seems like it would be quite so we So we haven't designed it yet. It would be something similar to that. And you could do it daily instead of at the end of the pay period because it would be a, you know, a good amount of information as you're saying. So we're trying to make it as flexible and as many options um, to make it so people can do it how it works for them. But I have, but I have some other, I have some other people who are waiting to comment in the room. So I'm going okay, to thank you very much. Comment, okay. Thank you very much. But please give them the microphone because for 30 minutes, of, we, we on the phone could not hear anything those people were saying, and we would love to hear it. So and, thank you very much for your time. And we, and we were giving them the microphone, but I'm going to repeat it because you guys still can't hear it. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time, ma'am. Of course. I think I think they had one back there. Oh. Okay. No. Oh, no in the room. I I'm him. sorry. I, I thought I saw him, but I was incorrect. So we can go back to the phone if there's additional comments on the phone. Deborah Miles with PASC, please go ahead. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. First of all, I want to thank you for having a stakeholders meeting. Um, secondly, I just kind of wanted to give a, a brief overview just to make sure I understand everything that's been said thus far. And then I have one final question that I'll say for the end, if that's okay. And I'll be quick going through all of this. Okay, for implementation, you're considering using an online version consim uh, similar to the um, electronic timesheet, and I think that the e timesheet is working great, so I'm happy to hear that. Also, you're considering using an app, and also you're considering using a telephonic, uh, either landline or a cell, uh, cell phone for we're implementation. Looking at, we're looking at all of those options because we yes, have options available. So all of these are options. It's not one, two, or three. Correct. Okay. Good. Okay. Wonderful. Now, um, uh, one mandate of EVV is location, and to document location, you said use home or community, no matter what it is that you were doing, just select one of those two. Um, and then um, the start time and the end time will also help um, identify the location, and that's also uh, a requirement for EVV. Is that correct? So, so for location, the provider would be indicating when they've entered the other information, either home, community, or both, because during the or day both. they may have done both. And then, mm -hmm. and then they would also be entering the start time and the end time. And the start time would be the first service they provided for that recipient of the day, and the end time would be the last service they provided for that recipient of the day. And start right. and end time would not be associated to location. Those two things aren't intertwined. Okay. Wonderful. Now, do start and end time have to be recorded in the real time, or can they be recorded in the rears? They can be recorded in the rears. Wonderful. Okay. Also, did I hear you say there is no GPS mandate? There is no GPS mandate, and we don't intend to use GPS for purposes of location. We intend to have the, that reported by the provider when they enter information. Okay. Type of services performed, that was another um, mandate for the EVV. And um, this documentation can be done once per shift, I think I heard someone say. And you would choose from a drop-down list that it's an IHSS service that's being provided. And that would satisfy that requirement. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Next, um, consumer responsibilities with regards to EVV. The consumer would have to put approve provider hours once per pay period, is that correct? Yes. Okay, now, uh, last, thank you so much for all of that now. Last is my question, uh, it's a statement slash question. There's a lot of money being placed into the implementation of EVV. What agencies will oversee this funding and will any of this funding be used to improve the IHSS program? So, Funding will be for 
development and implementation of EDV. Um, that would include uh, the development of the, the system itself, meaning enhancing our um, ETS structure within the um, within the application, the online system, developing a telephonic system, developing an app, um, and then it would also be the implementation, so all the outreach and the training and the support, help desk, those kinds of things to ensure that recipients and providers have the support they needed in understanding how the new system works um, and what, what they would need to do. Uh, so that's primarily what, what that funding is, is for. Who oversees that funding and who decides who gets it? Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not. Who who's going to develop the system? Who gets? The no, ma'am. I'm asking about the funding specifically. Who oversees it and who decides who gets okay, that so funding? Who decides who gets to do the training, the outreach, all of that? Okay. So based on um, the stakeholder recipient provider feedback, that there was. Um, a desire to build that within our own system. So mm -hmm. we we aren't look at, we are not looking at going out and procuring buying something new from a vendor. We're looking at okay. using that money to do an enhancement to our current systems. Yes. And we and we would oversee that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, it does. Thank you. And again, thank you all for um providing this opportunity for us. Of course. Marty in the room has a question or comment. Uh, Marty, your motto is uh, to can California Disability Youth in the Action Network. Um, so to follow on that point about the development funding, uh, if you can just restate for everybody what the total amount is. And also for that, so I understand how that applies to IHSS and waiver personal care services. but. How would that apply to the regional center uh, system of, of providers <clears throat> the regional centers themselves since the development there would be different? And it's going to be important to have those costs um, passed on you know, to the providers because the cost of development is not being passed on to the recipients or the uh, IHSS workers in, you know, in, this, in this system. And, and people with development of disabilities cross over to both, so it's going to be important that you know, the, the development is working in the same way. And, but I do want to uh, uh, compliment, and I think mm -hmm. this room and both in the phone are really uh, applied to this, this concept in terms of making the implementation as non intrusive and as respectful of people's privacy and time uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, like everything, it's going to have to be in the details. So. We'll all keep working together. But going back to development, one last thing on a personal note, it's more personal in terms of advocacy for all of us, some of us in this room. Um, this is an advocate um, who worked really hard in IHSS and also another disability rights, uh, Lisa Brown from Fresno. She has a son in Nellis, and she's gravely ill in the hospital. I just want to make sure that people know that if she was well, she would be here and that um, she could use your thoughts and prayers. Thank you. So Marty was asking a follow-up question to the, the funding, both in relationship to what we're talking about today as well as in relationship to the other agency model um, programs that will be implementing EVV. So as far as the amount of funding, we don't know yet because we haven't decided exactly what we're doing. We're still figuring all that out in these conversations. Um, what I can say about the, the funding is there will be federal funding available for the design and development. They, they pay 90% of the development design and implementation. The state pays 10%. And then the maintenance and oper operations is 75% federal dollars and 25% state dollars. Um, as, and what we, what we will be doing as we figure out how we want to do this 
is then we will be determining how much it costs to make those changes to our systems um, for the individual provider model, meaning the WPCS and the IHSS program. <coughs> for the other programs um, that use different models and the agency model, then those stakeholder conversations will need to take place to determine how that approach is going to occur. And based on that approach, then there will be um, then they'll be able to find to determine what the cost would be, and there would be the same um, federal funding available for that piece as well. Mm -hmm. Georgia, California. Just for consideration, moving forward, perhaps this has been a comment that's already been committed or given to you guys, but. When we're going back and forth between IHSS and GDS, one concern is that it's two separate processes is that often it is the same person in the home providing the services. And so now it is, this is going to be two separate submissions based on these are IHSS hours, these are support living service hours. That is going to be cumbersome. I want to just a lot of service getting to that process. I think I think it depends on the model, if it's an individual provider or they're being um, doing it through an agency. And, and it is two different, it's an IHSS and an agency provider, but it's the same person okay. and the same consumer. Okay. And then have two different processes. That's already, sorry. It already is. Right. And it would continue. Yeah. But I certainly think your comment is well taken, and I think as a part of the discussion, <coughs> when we get to the other piece and looking at the agency model, whatever can be done to make those make sense together. I'm thinking out loud as well in that comment, mm -hmm. like how the agency and where that's going to be deployed. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Understanding what you're saying. So, what she's asking about is the interrelationship between the um, authorization of services and this type of a system. And they would be related in the same way they are today, which is pretty much their. Just yeah. <laughs> so, you, you are, when you're reporting your time, going to go in and put in the total amount of hours that you worked that day, just like you do today. The difference is you're going to add the first time the time that you first started providing a service and the time you ended a service. So it's just some additional information that way. It wouldn't change the authorization or that interrelationship. Anyone else on the phone that had a comment? Alicia Hopkins with Consumer Advocate. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions actually, um, and then I want to comment something on the mobile app too. So, how do you plan to work with clients and families that are have guardianships? Because people with guardianships and minors aren't really held liable for signatures, um, and there's not always there might not always be a family member <laughs> available. I guess like how do you plan to deal with EBV and the guardianship aspect of things. And in that, I want to ask, how how do you plan, I know you're talking about the telephony version and all of that, but how do you plan to accommodate people with cognitive disabilities? Like the lady who mentioned that her, her client can't use a phone, okay? How do you, and, and, and I know she was hinting on this, is that people with cognitive disabilities might not also be able to use a phone. Enter, they might not even know how to enter you know, push buttons or even talk on the phone. So how do you plan to address those ADA concerns? 
So it really shouldn't be all that different than it is today. So today the recipient is still is responsible for reviewing time, signing a timesheet. If they have um, guardianship or conservatorship or a cognitive impairment such that they're unable to do those things, then there should be someone in their life, their guardian, their conservator, um, that is responsible for those activities generally, and then those individuals would be the ones who would be doing the, the same process they do with timesheets today. They would just be okay. using the new format. Okay. And then I have a question about the mobile app. How can, because most mobile apps um, do ask to um, requirements of location, and you have to give, like, when you have a mobile app on a phone, generally most people don't know that usually the app will request, um, you know, con your contacts, it will request, you know, access to your data, you know, the camera, all of that. So how can you assure the public that the mobile app that you're looking at will not be geo-tracking the individuals using it? Well, I think that today you can turn it on or off on that device and you would have the same capability. And clearly we are not going to be requiring someone to use a mobile app. They can go online into the website itself and enter the information. I know, but I'm just right. saying that they might not know that, that the app. So, so a lot of people aren't like tech savvy, but there are people that are. But the people that are non-tech savvy, say they chose the mobile app version. If they don't look at the, if they don't know to look at their app permissions, then they're not going to know that the, that the mobile app would be tracking them. Well, and so you know we're not I mean? going to be, so we're not going to be collecting that information. Um, okay. if, if they if they don't know how to turn it off, it's already doing that for them now. Um, for everything else they're doing. Um, so that that's entirely you know up to them how they want to handle that. But we wouldn't be collecting that. Okay, thank you. Rosita Whitaker, IHSS provider, please go ahead. Hello. Thank you so much for all you do and for having this online conference. This is very handy. Um, my primary question, I, I think the whole EDV implementation sounds really easy, and um, we shouldn't have any fears at all. I'm impressed. <laughs> it's going just the way I thought it would. Anyway, my primary question is, um, are you going to eliminate paper timesheets? Yes. So that is the intent, that paper timesheets wouldn't have to be completed any longer, that by entering information into the EVV system, whether that be online or by telephone or on an app, that that would automatically transmit the information for payment purposes. Right, and right, right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm asking in regards to, um, there are a few providers and clients that live out in the boonies to where their telephone reception is really bad and uh, so is their internet. So I'm I'm kind of concerned with them. Plus there yeah. are a lot of them that are not internet savvy. And I, know, I like the idea of the phone line. You can just call in and push buttons and whatever, go to a, um, a program to implement all, uh, all the information. That yeah, sounds great. But... Yeah. But the uh, paper timesheets will be eliminated. That was my only well, question. Well, and, and so everything me, else was answered along the way. So let me let me just caveat that. I mean, that is the intent is to not have to do the any kind of a duplicate process, and that it would replace using EVV would replace the paper timesheets. However, you're you're correct in that there may be these very um, specific circumstances. We're hoping by having the telephone lines and and the different options that will reach the vast majority of folks. But if there is um, really specific circumstances where there's an issue or a problem, we're going to have to kind of think through how we need to approach that. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't be in a hurry to get rid of the paper because I got a feeling there's, I know of two specifically, uh, that they they just, there there are times uh, period, periodically that they, uh, they have, actually, they have to drive like 50 miles just to mail their timesheets. 
So, and we, yeah, um, yeah and we certainly, here in we California, certainly, you know. We certainly don't want that, and so we'll have to look at those on a case-by-case -case situation, and we'll have yeah, to kind of Yeah, don't think, be in a hurry so. to get rid of the paper timesheets, because that may be a, that may be a, a last resort for last many, uh, yeah, recipients and providers. And that's all, that's the only question I really had, and I, I felt it was really mandatory that I uh, I get this information out and um, uh, so it's not a definite have to it's just a consideration you you're thinking of getting rid of paper timesheets but well like I said the the intent is to replace the paper timesheets so that we we are using the other system people certainly aren't going to do both you know what we will do for situations where uh, specific situations where people are in an odd circumstance, we're going to have to think through the best approach to do that. Definitely, definitely. Well, then they're they're not going to lose their in-home support services because of this circumstance. Am I correct? I'm sorry, I missed I missed what you said. Their in-home support services is not going to be cut off because of the circumstance. That's Am I right. correct? That's right. Okay. Okay. That that's that's what I really needed to know because, like I say, don't get in a, a big hurry to get rid of the paper timesheets because there's uh, there'll be quite a few that uh, they're a necessity for them. That's right. And again, thank you for all you do. I appreciate it. Of course. Luke Ferguson with Centene Corporation. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, so I guess the way that I understand this system to work, correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that uh, the recipients really need to be keeping track of their own time uh, separately to do any real um, kind of uh, validation or confirmation of visits. Is that correct? So, so they would be doing a similar thing to what they do today. Yes. So they're going to they're going to keep track of the hours they have their provider work so that they can validate that at the end of the pay period. Okay. Um, yeah. Just I didn't know like how you know if there's concern on how burdensome that can be on the recipient themselves. If anyone else has brought up that concern, um, and if the use of uh, electronic visit verification. Um, it being implemented would essentially help reduce some of that burden if there was more uh, real-time verification that was done. Um, and maybe that's not a concern, but it's just something I wanted, uh, I guess, to, to bring up. Um, and I guess the other question I have is that I know that, um, you know, at this point in time that these are said to be in compliance with the Cures Act, is the, has CMS stated anything about um, going through an approval process to make sure that the proposed um, the proposed process here would meet the Cures Act, um, or what is going to be the verification of that? And I don't think they have an approval process set up at this point in time. I believe it's they're giving a lot of latitude to the states to um, implement this in the way that um, works to works for the state and with input from stakeholders and recipients, providers of service to ensure it's um, an approach that works the best in the state. Okay. Um, and my last, it's more really, I guess, a, a statement than a, than a question, but for some of the providers that may be um, tracking um, some of their timesheets or entering their timesheets in on uh, a non-daily basis, whether it's, you know, a, a pay period basis, I would assume that that also kind of limits the opportunity of the alerts that you spoke of earlier um, that would kind of let you know when you're starting to run out of hours. So if you're not keeping track of that on a more consistent basis, then you're not going to be taking advantage of those types of uh, alerts that are available. Actually, they would still get the alerts, and it's probably going to be when they're going to get the alerts is when they hit the point in time where they would be going over those overtime rules 
um, and that most likely actually would be towards the end, hopefully, <laughs> of the um, of the pay period, but they will get them in real time as soon as they hit that point. So as they're entering the information into whatever, whether it be on phone or on um, an application uh, online, they would, uh, when they entered the time that hit that point, they would get that alert and it would allow them to um, correct any errors in what they had entered to um, prevent uh, violations. Right, but if the, if the provider's not entering in the times until the end of the pay period and they've already completed all of their work, then essentially those alerts wouldn't come out until they're putting in the time, correct? Just so yeah. I'm just trying to understand. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Right, so at that point in time, if all the hours had been completed and they're not keeping track of if they're overgoing the, uh, the authorization, that is a potential risk? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's all my questions. Thank you. Uh -huh. Meredith McCurphy with San Diego Public Authority. Please go ahead. Hello there. Um, my question has actually been answered. It was about the paper timesheets and the elimination of them. So thank you. We're going to go back to the room for a second. Lila Gonzalez with the PASC, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, what languages is this going to be offered? Is that going to be through all three platforms? And also, will your online version be compatible with uh, visual readers for those that have low vision or are blind? Yes, to all of that. Um, we would be translating. Um, both the provider and recipient information, uh, whether online or an application or on the phone into the state threshold languages, um, and it would also be compatible with uh, visual readers. We would be doing all of the appropriate uh, accommodations in those ways. Thank you. We have something in the room. Well, I can I can see the time to go the recording at the hours. I'm sure if there's any issue or a penalty of some sort, um, if the recipient myself keeps a record of the hours and services and all that, whether it's media or whatever, and does the, what I'm doing now, which is the time sheet, and then going keeping track of it and organizing it, will that will I still be allowed to do that, or would you prefer that my caregiver, because all of my caregivers we have had one or two at a time if it's like a critical care situation. Um, they all have jobs. <laughs> so I usually do the organization. So, so that's something you would need to work out with your care provider. The provider will have their own PIN to access the system. And so um, if, if, if there's a need for assistance between the two of you, then you would have to work that out together. Anything else on the phone? Anything else on the phone? Rana Rami with IHSS Los Angeles. Please go ahead. I think you're talking about me, Raya Rama, probably. Hello? Yes, yes go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm just question. Uh, a lot of questions already been answered in regarding to the language availability. So it's only available for the state threshold land language, not for the Los Angeles County threshold language, right? Because we have a lot more languages here. At this point, where we we can confirm threshold statewide languages would be done. That's certainly something that we can evaluate whether or not there's an opportunity to do anything beyond that. And regarding to, because of some providers, by the time that they clear all the enrollment process, they usually the first, at least the first payment and all that, they're going to be uh, retroactively. So they're going to go through the system to verify the location and start time and all that retroactively the first time? 
could be two months back. Under, understood. That's something that we'll need to, to think through. I know on the current electronic timesheets, um, th at the point in time they become active and enrolled into that system, they would get uh, generated any timesheets that um, were applicable to the date of hire for them that they would then complete at that point in time. Um, we'll need to think through the, the retroactivity and, and how to best approach that. Thank you. Barry Giardini with CDSA, please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. I believe my question's mostly been answered, but if you could confirm, the, the paradigm that you're setting out here is strictly for the individual providers and not for uh, larger agencies who provide services to individuals with developmental disabilities, is that correct? That's correct. And there okay. will be a process to, that will, will be happening to address that, that piece of things. Okay. Thank you so much. Elizabeth Anderson with Harmony Home Association. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity. All my questions have been answered. Thank you. Peter Mendoza with Marin Center for Independent Living, please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for having this uh, meeting. I really, really appreciate it. I had a couple of questions. One is, I know you mentioned that we would only report the location as community or at home, but what if a person's home fluctuates? Or they have to go into shelter at their home? Isn't in a let's say they're they're at risk housing wise, so they may have to stay at more than one location. The other question I had is, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people with disabilities and actually providers don't have access to tech or even cell phones. How is that issue going to be addressed? Um, I guess my question is more, is the state preparing to allocate some money for folks that may not have equipment so they can comply? And I also think the language access issue is really important. So I would hate to see people not be able to participate in the program because the EDV wasn't available in their primary language. Thank you. So your first question around home or community, it would be the re the provider reporting on that day, you know, and even if your home changed or you were, if you, if it was your home on that day, then it would be your home. Um, otherwise, it would be within the community. The, the best effort to respond to that would be the provider answering that question and entering that information, um, and. As far as uh, people's and equipment, we anticipate that mo trying to do it in a variety of ways will accommodate the vast majority of folks. If there are specific individual circumstances, then we'll have to look at those on a case-by-case -case situation and see what appropriate accommodation would need to be provided. Um, and your last comment is is well taken to to make sure that we are addressing the um, the different languages. Thank you for that. Jasmine Marino with Health Talent Two, please go ahead. Hi there, good afternoon. Um, I only have one question because my first question was somewhat answered um, earlier on in regards to the funding um, for uh, vendors um, uh, for EV, EV, EVV implementation. Um, but my second question was you had mentioned earlier um, that uh, California was not going to be able to meet the implementation deadline of January 2019. Um, so what does that mean, and do we have any type of timeline as to when we are expected to go live with this new uh, reporting format? 
So what that means is that we will be, DHCS, we will be working with them to work with CMS to request a good faith effort um, delay of any penalty um, so that we can extend the amount of time in order for us to do the processes that are required by the statute, which is to in, do a full stakeholder process and to um, take all of that input as a part of our development and to ensure that there is appropriate training for everyone that that will be utilizing the system. And California is in a unique position is that we have a very large population. Probably the majority of personal care um, service providers nationwide are here in California. So us doing this implementation is just bound to take additional time to do it by the requirements of the statute and, and in the way that we want and intend um, to be deliberate and thoughtful and involve um, everyone in that process, it, it, it's going to take time. So that's what that means. And the second part of your question was, I just forgot. Can you tell me the second part of your question? Oh, I just wanted to see if we had any type of timeline um, in mind as to when we are going to be going live. Um, we, we don't yet because we're still figuring out and finalizing kind of what the approach is going to be. A lot of that was to hear today whether or not what we were thinking was um, made sense to people and get that comment. And then once we know that, we can start looking at what the development, how long that would take, and then certainly training and outreach and implementation, all of that will take time. We don't have a developed timeline at this point. Okay. And I have one more question. Um, if I have questions that I think of, you know, after or in between these calls, who can I reach out to in the meantime? Well, that was a perfect segue. <laughs> so, so we are approaching the end of our time here, and I absolutely wanted to let let people know that on our website um, we are going to be posting information from today's meeting. We have additional information posted about EVV, um, as well as um, our website that people can send. Um, our, our, sorry, our email box that people can send information and questions to, as well as they can send information and questions directly through the mail if that's their preference. So we definitely want to continue to take comments um, from everyone. Uh, do you have access to the website, or otherwise I can read you the address? I actually I do have access to the website, so thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of um, Belinda Stadley with Staff EVV. Please go ahead. Yes, that's with Stop EVV. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would just like to second what, other, what others have said about not being able to hear comments. So if you could actually, it would be appreciated if you could work with the teleconferencing selection. Um, I, I'm being on the phone. I couldn't. I can't hear any of the in-room comments by people, and those are to me just as important as the answers. And that uh, person you uh, commenter, you said that was an outstanding statement. Um, I didn't hear any of it, and I wish that I could have heard that. It was kind of long, and so you weren't able to repeat it at all. So that would be great for the future. Um, so um, today you mentioned you have been talking about uh, workers and uh, consumers having an option or having the choice of uh, doing this reporting daily or at the end of the pay period or specifically within two weeks of the pay period ending, which is the current paper requirement. And that was very relieving for me to hear because the daily reporting requirement would be so different from what uh, a lot of us do now uh, with our workers, which is, you know, we pull stuff together, we keep track and so on, but we don't have to 
do reporting every day. And so to me, that was is a major difference. And if you're trying to be consistent as possible with uh, what we have been doing all along, uh, that that would be more consistent to allow people that choice to do it at the end of the pay period or within two weeks. So just wanted to uh, say I was glad to hear about that. Um, back in January, I communicated with CBS. I said, I don't remember if it was in person or by email, but uh, at that time, uh, some of us were looking at, um, uh, well, we were trying to look back at the October, the first stakeholder meeting to see what the comments were, the, um, not written comments, but people who were there. And I was told that the audio tapes would be available soon. Um, online and still waiting for that, and you did mention it today. Um, so I'm still hoping that uh, that will be able to uh, be available soon, the audio comments of all the stakeholders, because all those are should be part of the record, I believe, uh, as being part of public comment. And, and since CDS is so committed to the stakeholder meetings, um, I would assume that at some point, you, because I asked at that time, are you going to summarize for the public or just provide them one by one uh, individually as really they should be uh, so that we can track that as well uh, you know, in terms of transparency and that each comment to me, the person goes to such trouble, you know, to provide a comment that they should be uh, somehow memorialized and be available for this process. So. I mean, for example, I, uh, to tell the truth, I was really shocked at our last stakeholder meeting when um, when you said that you didn't think that EBV would affect the availability of um, workers. And so much of the comments that people are providing written and orally, not so much today, but in the past, uh, that that is a real problem for us. And we're not making it up. Um, this is, I guess some people tr think that it's not going to be that difficult. But from where I see it, it's going to be extremely complicated. And we cannot forget that our workers get paid less than minimum wage. And they're not compensated for this time. And here's the question, you know, is this the time to do this going to come out of their work time? And um, workers, current workers, did not sign on to do technology. And I have, you know, I think that many, many of workers are not going to want to take this on because um, it is another layer. It is a technology layer, and it's going to make a big difference. So um, anyway, uh, just looking forward to being able to. Uh, capture all of the comments, and again, wondering uh, how CDSS is going to do that as well, so that they will all be available. And I uh, want to thank you for, it is obvious that CDSS is really working hard to make this as simple as possible, um, even though it is very difficult and going to be difficult for many of us uh, ongoing, and I don't like being tracked, why is, uh, you know, I want to uh, thank the people who asked why. Why do they want this kind of information? Why do they want to do anything that would make our lives more difficult, that would add even a, a moment of difficulty to us? Um, you know, it's hard enough. So uh, I, I just don't understand why the federal government wants to do this, and I, I don't feel good about it. And do that. So, again, thank you for all your efforts, and that's it. Thank you. And we still are intending to um, post the audio of all of the stakeholder meetings. And I'm looking at Carol, who's working on it right now. So she's saying. Very, very so they've almost figured out all the technical um, approach to being able to do that. So that should be being posted. Um, 
when, and what she said is when um, it gets posted, we will send an email out to the distribution list to make sure that people are aware that it's up on the website when it goes up. Um, and we also are trying to put up documents that people can look at that give like Q&A, frequently asked questions, documents. We'll put um, the information from today's meeting, general information that I um, shared um, in a document so you can see it there on the website. So that will be up there as well as the audios from the stakeholder meeting and we'll let you know when the stakeholder meeting audios are up. Um, and if you heard me say that in the last meeting that this wouldn't impact um, ad uh, ability to get providers. I don't recall saying that. I did not, I misspoke if I said that. Um, I do understand that it, it, it can be difficult and it can have an impact. And what, what I do want to say is that we're doing everything we can to try and figure out a way to make it as least cumbersome as we can for everybody. And that is our, our intent, to make it as easy as possible and to to try and avoid that furthering of any difficulty in getting providers. Um, we're, we're, we've kind of hit the end of our, our time. I, I have one comment in the room that I'm going to take and then we're going to just wrap up. Um, I, I, I think I speak for a lot of people that I know when I say that we are very grateful for um, your efforts in this. But that does not in any way negate the way you feel about this extra layer of stuff being put on us, number one, which, which will tend to complicate things and make it more difficult for, for a lot of people to find providers. But there's also this sense, you know, when we look at the things money being thrown at you in this, there's a lot of us that are just like, and could we give us some money to just make the system better for all of us? Really? Would that be so hard? You know, and, and again, we know that that's something that can be directed at the federal level and we're trying to do that. But it's still just a burr on the NR saddle every time we have to come here and do this because we care about the money available and we're like, yikes, what we could do with something like that is if, if the mandate were just to make it easier instead of to collect this information. Thank you so much, Connie, for being here and for your comments. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We look forward to continuing to hear from you and to, to do this in the way that is easiest for everyone. Um, do send in any comments that you have further in any of the other ways, and we'll continue to have meetings regularly. Thank you again for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Executive Teleconference Service. You may now dis